Good afternoon, everyone. Wake up. We only have a few hours left. Um, <laughs> okay, so with all this evidence, talk about evidence and time. You're not on the phone, Renee, are you? <laughs> that's what we do. Yeah, that's the way we do it in class. So w with all this uh, talk about evidence um, in general and all the, the, the kind of discussion we've had so far, I'm going to pinpoint it down to two specific issues, use of force and pursuits. Nothing controversial, of course. So us and them, researchers and practitioners. Now, we are coming together. There, there's so much work here at George Mason and around the country translating research into practice, looking at researcher-practitioner partnerships, looking at a variety of ways that uh, uh, we get together and, and we do things together. It used to be, yeah, we researchers would come in and ask you uh, for data, or you'd come and ask us to get you out of a jam, uh, and how we could interpret it, how we could uh, figure out what it all meant. Now we're really doing this as a partnership, and it, it, it's moving the field significantly further. And in these two areas, uh, is, uh, I think we'll go over a little bit today some of the general principles. What I put up here is we're not going to go over specific data from agencies. Those data are available you know, on the internet. They're available in, in Police Chief, FBI Law Enforcement Magazine, Police Foundation. They're around. You can get those data. But what I want to talk about are what are these data? What are their importance? Now, a couple of things. Uh, pursuits, because I'll talk about those last. But let me just say, in the 1970s, uh, chase them to the wheels fall off. I mean, that's the way it was. We, we uh, uh, pursuits were just the bad guy takes off, you chase him, hell with everything else. In the 1980s, we started worrying about officer safety. In the 1990s, we started worrying about public safety. And now we're seeing a lot of departments, the, the trend has been for a long time to restrict pursuits to violent crimes. Now, why is that? Why did we change? It's the same evidence, it's the same information, it's the same ideas, but we've changed our practice. Why? Cowardism? Cowardice. Um, I don't know, I'm not sure if that's exactly the right term. There, there are a lot, of, a lot of people alive today, innocent bystanders, who would say thank you. Uh, and for not being a coward, actually for having that courageous conversation not to be stupid, not to go chase people who put everyone else's life at risk. So my point here is that evidence comes in a lot of different ways. Uh, we've talked about empirical evidence, we've talked about qualitative and quantitative. Uh, someone even mentioned that, gosh, you might talk to your police friends down the road, see what they do. That's evidence. That's important evidence. Just because you've done it a certain way doesn't mean it's wrong, it may not mean it's right, but it's, if it's had success in other departments, then it has something, uh, uh, some success to talk about. Uh, your own experience, obviously, is evidence. How do you take it? How do you interpret it? How do you use it? And what do you learn from this combination? Because someone out there, you as a supervisor, in many of your uh, policies and pursuits, for example, you've got to make that call. The officer may get caught up in the moment, the heat of the chase, so to speak, and you've got to make the call. Well, how do you make it? What's it based on? Is it a gut instinct or is it something else? Now, in, in the use of force, for example, most of the data we have, most of the data we analyze, if you will, is from your reports. And trust me, some of those reports or policy language, boilerplate language, uh, not really explaining why you were in fear of your life, why you had to use a, a, a taser or a, a OC spray or whatever it is you used, uh, other than there was aggressive activity or aggressive resistance. Um, sometimes those reports don't give us very much information. Now, Renee mentioned consent decrees. And for example, the Justice Department in Seattle investigated their use of force and found 20% of their use of force reports to be excessive. I'm sorry, their use of force incidents from their reports. 
to be excessive. And therefore, the consent decree came, and, and uh, I think it's still in, a, in kind of a mess out there. We reanalyzed those data, same data, same reports, and we came up with 0.02 percent being excessive. Same evidence, same information. How in the world could the Justice Department investigators find 20 percent and we found significantly less? What, what's, how do you explain that? And trust me, we've asked the Justice Department and really haven't come up with a very good answer. Uh, Jim Berman was, was talking about, uh, and I'll paraphrase, there's evidence and there's evidence. Because there are different quality of evidence out there. The, we've got to figure out what's good evidence, what's not such good evidence, what's good science, or what's just kind of standing there in, in the name of science. So in use of force, what do we know? What is the information we collect on which we make these decisions? And particularly if you, you know, we can, I can talk to you very specifically about the S Seattle, uh, we've done research in Miami, we've done research in a lot of departments around the country looking at these reports. Some of the reports are simply the officers' versions and the, yeah, rubber stamped by the supervisors uh, up the chain. Some of them are written by the supervisors after asking the officer, the suspect, and then doing witness canvassing to see what what else is known? Some of these are really comprehensive quality reports uh, where, where uh, uh, leading questions weren't asked, where descriptions were given, where explanations were given, and it gives anyone who's reading them a real good understanding of what happened. Others are not quite such good quality. Others uh, are boilerplate. Others are using policy language. Others are basically justifications for what happened not really what happened. Even things with injuries. We see some reports that don't have pictures, you know, that the, the talk about things that happened. Uh, you know, the suspect uh, had no injury. Well, where's the picture? Where's some evidence? Where's some information? How can we make decisions on who the officers are, where the problem areas are, what's going on in the community if we don't have good information? And what is it about uh, the business of policing that doesn't encourage you to write thorough, complete, and, and comprehensive reports? And, and what about the supervisors? How do you rubber stamp the ones that don't explain it? So I think what we need to understand is what's going on in, in the use of force? How are these data elements not there? What do, you, what do your reports look like? And who's looking at them? And of course, the, you know, the big question is uh, what information is available that wasn't captured? Why wasn't it captured? And trust me, if these aren't things you're asking yourself, if there's a questionable use of force, you're going to get asked under the spotlight. And we're starting to see, I, it was an IACP meeting a year or so ago, and I don't remember who brought it up, but he said that probably the best information we have on use of force incidents are depositions. And it's really kind of interesting. He brought and, and actually had some at this meeting where officers and supervisors were asked questions under oath and couldn't answer what the policy meant, couldn't answer what the levels of force and levels of resistance, where this continuum was. They couldn't answer their own policies. And that's pretty embarrassing. So there's some training elements, there's some reporting elements, and there's really some understanding of what happened. Most of the time, and we're starting to see body cameras now go, go everywhere. I don't know how many of your departments are using them or are going to use them. Uh, we saw in Rialto a study done, I guess Jim left, but a study done at the Police Foundation that was really quite telling about uh, the use of force and body cameras and how important they are. And we're going to start see the, seeing this in a lot of departments where now we're going to have another level of evidence another level of information, and according to the Supreme Court, right or wrong, uh, video evidence is really, is really important. So why collect it? Why do all of this that makes your life miserable and makes report writing comprehensive and, and thorough? First of all, policies. What is your policy? Why is your policy written the way it is? Is it in line with reality? and certainly leads into training. 
Third, we find very easy, uh, sometimes, equipment modifications. We see holsters that aren't working. We see, you know, suspects reaching for guns. Well, if you have a good holster and you're in the right position, uh, can that gun really come out? Uh, do you need a new kind of holster? There also, we've seen a lot of events where suspects have taken guns, and, and, and most of the time it, it leads to a modification of a, of a holster and other kinds of equipment. Um, certainly discipline, early warning systems. We're seeing those bec become much more popular. I guess we don't call them early warning, we call them uh, performance. Uh, um, they're broader than just the use of force and a few other incidents. It's much more of a performance-based system that looks at everything about your behavior and about your your activities and then you as the supervisor are able to see you know even though each event was legitimate and each event was okay is there a pattern or trend of those events that may need some remediation is there a pattern or trend and I recall one when we did this in Miami looking at uh, the use of force an officer used it multiple times and it, he did hit the early warning system which was fine because each event had already gone through scrutiny but if you read them each time he hit the suspect in the face and the trainer said you know we don't train that there's better ways to do it you know in this situation it might be reasonable but not every time and it was a simple matter of training and the officer continued to use force and continued to be a good cop but quit hitting the person in the face all the time simple things like that that come up from analysis of data Certainly uh, in, a, in the defense of a lawsuit. You know, a lot of these use of force incidents and pursuits, you're going to get sued. And the, if you don't have a thorough report, it looks bad. And that's when these lawyers will come under the hot spotlight and, and put you under oath and ask you questions. And, and even if you have the answers in a deposition, why did you, aren't you supposed to write a thorough report? Doesn't your policy say your, your reports are supposed to be um, uh, comprehensive, well, why didn't you put this in? Why didn't you put that in? Uh, up on another slide was inconsistencies. How come there's so many inconsistencies, not just between you and your partner, which can be explained by different views, or you and the camera, which can be explained by different views, but you have multiple inconsistencies. How come that never got caught when your supervisor was reading the report? We did a, a, a thing, and uh, as explained to Chief Stevens, we did this uh, study in Charlotte Mecklenburg after he left um, the chief took tasers away because there had been three deaths I believe in a very short period of time and, and the chief wanted to know what in the world was going on well after reviewing uh, a lot of the reports it, it was the same kind of thing they were they were policy language in the report it didn't explain you couldn't tell from reading these reports why the officer used uh, uh, this device and why he or she used it so many times. What was the justification? What was the justification for each time the officer pulled the, the trigger uh, on that device? What was the threat? It wasn't in there. And believe me, there were the lawsuits, and I don't remember what the dollar amounts were on those deaths, but it was significant. How many? Ten million. Ten million dollars. Uh, you know, not saying had the reports been more thorough, they wouldn't have had to pay the money, but it would have made a lot more sense. So there's some reasons why you fill out these, these forms. Um, there's a reason why you collect the information. And what you can do very easily now, and certainly partnering up with someone at a university or someone, one of your crime analysts, is creating a database, figuring out uh, a, putting these use of force reports in a database. We've talked about databases for everything else, but we haven't talked about uh, this particular s tactic or this particular strategy of pu simply putting the use of force reports. Now, if you're a CALEA uh, agency, you have to do some reporting. Doesn't mean you have to use the data, but at least you have to collect it. And I think that's one of the things that uh, we find pretty compelling is, okay, you collect it, you actually put it in a table, and then no one looks at it. Well, we're kind of suggesting as, as researchers and those who want to look at the evidence is create a database, track the trends, track the practices, track the places. I mean, we've been talking about uh, analyzing people and places for, for crime. It's no different for your own tactics and your own strategies. Uh, where do these events occur most often? 
Is it a problem? Is it something you can address? Is it something that you could somehow the department could make a difference in terms of its of its lighting, in terms of its policies, in terms of its putting two officers in one place, having backup, whatever the situation might be, are there places where force is used um, that you could do something about it? Analyses of these data might be able to provide you an understanding of what your officers are dealing with. If you don't have the level of suspect resistance, if you don't have what the suspect did, then it's kind of difficult to justify what the officer did. And it's a very simple thing to do, although reading a lot of these reports, you don't see it. You see active resistance or you see some boilerplate language instead of simply saying uh, exactly what the officer, what the suspect did and why the officer had to use a certain level of force to respond. And actually what we're talking about is um, looking at practices, looking at trends, and really what we create are de facto policies. Even though it's not written, if that's what you've been doing, it's going to show up as a de facto policy. So um, what I mean, these are kind of gram factors that it, it transposed a little bit, but why an officer can use force, what are the justifications, uh, and more important, I think, is uh, analyzing the relative use of force to the suspect's resistance. And that's what we did in Seattle, and that's what we were able to look at uh, the uses of force uh, the, the, the 1,260 that the Justice Department looked at, and we were able to look at the level of force the officer used and the level of resistance the suspect used, and these reports were pretty good, and it was obvious that it wasn't 20 percent. There was no way there could have been 20 percent that were that far out of joint. But it was because the data were written pretty well uh, that we were able to, to challenge that. Um, Moving to emergency and pursuit driving, if you think the use of force is a controversial issue, wait till you hear this one. Uh, it, like I said before, in the, in the 70s and even into the 80s, it was in some departments, chase them to the wheels fall off. Why? You know, we heard one comment that uh, uh, that's the way it should be maybe, that's the, you know, that we shouldn't let the bad guys get away when they run. Um, but what about the public safety balance? What about the... Um, collection and use of data to find out how many of these pursuits end in a disaster for nothing. And, and other than the suspect fleeing, which pisses you off, no doubt, what else is there? What do we know about the people who flee? What do we know about their behavior? What do we know about the officers who chase? What do we know about their actions? And certainly you as first line and second line supervisors, you know, you're the ones who can get on the radio and cut them off when you think they've gone too far. So the question is how do you balance that need to immediately apprehend and the risk created by the chase? Most of the policies we see in the 17,847 departments today are going to be just, use just that language. You've got to balance them. And then we'll give you a whole list of factors uh, including the offense known, including the traffic conditions, the road conditions, the condition of your vehicle, et cetera, et cetera. You've got to make that. And then if you don't make it as, a, as the first, uh, you know, as the primary officer, then it's the supervisor who comes in. The other departments have, the chief has made that decision for you and said it's going to be a violent crime or it's going to be a particular type of felony, or, or, you know, the most controversial one, and this is always a fun one to talk about, you chase drunk drivers, you see someone who's, who's uh, you suspect who's under the influence and is weaving, changing lanes, doing whatever, you turn your lights on and he takes off, you gonna chase him? Yes or no? All right, you think if he's not driving well at 40, how's he gonna drive at 60? You hit them, you can pit them. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's, well, never mind. <laughs> so the question becomes, and it's a, it's a tough one, what do you do with the drunk driver? If you chase him and you don't think he's driving well at 40, what's he going to do at 80? And yeah, if you pit him at 80, Lord knows what's, that's the Scott V. Harris kind of thing, you, know, you run him into a tree. Now, 
okay, I understand that Mr. Harris hit, went up over to the right and hit the tree. What if you'd gone to the left and hit someone else? I mean, there are all sorts of questions um, that you got to deal with. You just let them go. You just, you know, let them go and hope that uh, he slows down and doesn't uh, hit someone else. I mean, those are tough questions, and we can certainly get into an answer and why an answer is the way it is, but it's not easy, and if you don't have that ingrained in this, quote, muscle memory, uh, and you're out there trying to figure it out in the heat of the chase, it's going to take too long, and you're not going to have a good answer. So, what about the data issues around, whoops. And well, I mentioned this before, you have the judgmental policy and you have the restricted policy. But a management plan for pursuit goes a lot further. A management plan for pursuit goes into not only the policy but the supervision, the training and accountability. If you're the chief officer or you're the commander of that particular unit and you're in charge of managing these pursuit issues, what do you want your officers to do? And how are you going to get them to do it? And, and again, I can remember back in, in Miami-Dade in the 1980s, there were uh, 500 pursuits a year, 550 pursuits a year. Uh, they changed the policy in, in 92 to violent crimes only, and it went to 50 pursuits. And most of those were out of policy. And yeah, for the first year, you'd hear the muck, 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 muck on the radio, and you'd hear the clicking, and you'd hear all the comments about, you know, not having the guts to chase and not doing this and that. In today's department, most officers down there have never been in a chase. It, the culture has totally changed. The guy runs from you, get him another day. It's tough. It takes a long time for that to change, but that's what the community wanted. That's what the, the I mean, the, it was kind of driven by courts and driven by liability and large payouts, but really, that's what the community wanted them to do, was not put them at risk for events that weren't violent and weren't felonies. So again, just like in the use of force, uh, are there particular people, whether officers or citizens, are there places, are there situations, are there types of events that have end up in a result in more pursuits than others? Um, how can you explain these negative outcomes? How can you explain the crashes? How can you explain the cost to the public? Uh, and th those of you who've been in pursuits and they've ne ended negatively, it's tough. You know, how do you face the family? It's like any other kind of situation uh, of an innocent bystander. How do you deal with that? And it becomes a very difficult scenario. And what's the message you want to send? And how do you send it? Now, getting back to evidence, Getting back to the data, you know, uh, a lot of departments for a long time only collected information on crashes. Uh, gosh, I remember doing a study, I hate to date myself, uh, Dallas Police Department and use of deadly force. There was a book that you had to fill out, well, you didn't even have to fill it out, but they wanted you to fill it out if you shot your firearm and actually hit someone. You know, if you didn't hit someone, you didn't have to fill it out. We've come a long way since then. Now you've got 48 pages of reports to, to file every time you, you, you fire a weapon. Well, now we're starting to see the same kind of information collected on pursuits. And even some, you know, it's, it's, we don't see it very often in emergency runs, but we see sometimes uh, the CAD data collected on emergency runs. Why are you going code three? Why are you going that fast? Uh, we heard earlier about the, look, I think again, Renee was talking about the AVLs. We're starting to see those looked at when uh, you've been in a, a pursuit or even in a code three. Are you doing what you say you're doing? And uh, sometimes you are and sometimes you're not. But there are data that can be collected. There's evidence that management can collect to see what's going on and to understand the patterns and trends and make decisions about what should happen, about how the policy should be written, what should go on at the academy in terms of training, and how supervisors should make those decisions when officers may have trouble. Uh, you can, once you create a data set, start understanding risk, start understanding benefits, start understanding what should we do and how should we design our pursuit strategies. 
Um, uh, this isn't in the handouts because I just got it off the internet uh, the other day, um, and, and the the uh, um, Pennsylvania is one of the few states that has statewide reporting. I don't think Virginia does, does it? Statewide pursuit reporting? No. I think there's seven. I think Minnesota was the first, and I think Pennsylvania uh, has been doing this. Um, and these are, these, these are uh, 14 um, pursuits in which people died. Uh, and, and again, 13 were the violators, one was the bystander. Uh, but but then you start seeing injuries, you start seeing crashes, you start seeing over half were conducted for traffic violations and a fairly good percent for drunk drivers, and you're seeing 46% of these pursuits, uh, if you want to count them in terms of multiple crashes, had crashes. 34%, this is data interpretation again, of the 517, there were 34% that had a crash. That means one in three pursuits is going to result in at least one crash, and as we see by the 46%, all the, the, that we're going to have more crashes because a lot of pursuits result in more than one crash. Um, now, there's 70% apprehended. Uh, of course, most of those are after the crash. This is a simple figure they came up with with just physical damage. That's just repair. This is per pursuit. Uh, and of course, a lot of them didn't have any damage, so you can imagine the high end of, of some of the ones where you have multiple cars that are totaled. And you all know this better than I do. You've seen, uh, you've seen some of those vehicles. You've seen your colleagues who've, who've been in crashes. Uh, we were working with Prince George. Anyone here from Prince George's? Well, you know what, uh, what, what Kevin did over there to deal with the, the officer-involved crashes. And, and you lost three officers in five or six months or something. Uh, I would assume you haven't had an officer involved serious crash for a long time because of what he did. Because he changed the culture in that department to, to make sure that every officer understood. And now I guess he's doing it in Anne Arundel, so I think we'll see those numbers. It happened in Las Vegas. They lost three officers in six months, um, and, and they changed that culture. So we see how it can be done based on the data. We see how it can be done based on the, the guts and courage and the, the, what, what uh, I learned from, from Kevin, the, what he called a courageous conversation. And he had those courageous conversations. So you have them, you look at the data, the, the, the dollars, the time off for an officer injured. I mean, I, again, I, I shudder to think of the, uh, you can't even look at it in terms of financial cost, but the emotional cost, the videos that he created based on those crashes. Uh, you'd sit here and cry. Cal Post has videos of the same thing where, where uh, uh, you look at the devastation to the officer and his or her family as well as the innocent bystander. This is a simple figure of property damage. Doesn't even scratch the surface. So um, in a survey that was done of officers again in Minnesota, which was probably the best state with the best data, I should say the state with the best data, um, they reported uh, in, in uh, these pursuits, again, 34% resulting in crashes. What's so interesting about this 30 to 40% number is it seems to go across time and across place. You look at almost every state, most departments, you're going to have that same figure. 30 to 40% of every pursuit is going to result in a crash. Now, that's a decision someone's got to make. Is it worth it? Um, we uh, also know that officers and suspects report that once you turn the lights off on a pursuit, the suspect's going to slow down. Most suspects are going to slow down pretty quickly. This is what the officers told us in their best judgment. This is what the suspects told us, you know, and no one kind of believed them because they're just the fleeing suspects who said what they said. Um, but that's kind of the evidence as we knew it. Uh, and, and in terms of emergency responses, this, the survey also showed that a very small percent made a critical difference. So our evidence of suspects 
from surveys and interviews tells us one thing, but have, have, have you uh, Star Chase is a Virginia company. Is that, have any of you beta tested Star Chase? You know what it is? It's that technology that will shoot a, pro, uh, a GPS projectile onto the back of a car and you kind of, you, it, it's real time, the data in real time is sent back to a computer and you can determine where the car is, how fast the car is going. Um, where this was done in, in uh, Arizona and it's being done in, in, I thought it was done here somewhere too, but I know it's being in Arizona uh, uh, Department of Public Safety, Austin Police in Texas. There are a lot of departments that are testing it and what's so interesting is that when you look at the printout from these things, you can tell when the cop turns his lights off and guess what? The suspects slow down in a relatively short period of time. It's within 10 miles of the speed limit, they slow down within a couple miles on a freeway. Which is interesting because that's exactly what the officers thought what would happen, although they had a little bit longer range, and that's what the suspects said, that that's when they would slow down. So now we talk about levels of evidence, you have opinions, and you have attitudes, and now you have science, real science. You have the computer reports that show these cars slow down. So most of them, I think 90% of this, and it's a small number because Star Chase is pretty new, but the, it's a small number that shows that's exactly what happens and it's not attitudinal, it's not survey, it's computer generated real time data. So now we know that and maybe that will affect our policies, that will affect our training, that will affect our knowledge. So if we do have a drunk, and we're chasing the drunk and we just decide this guy's crazy, I'm not going to get involved, I'm not going to chase him, or you're chasing someone into a more populated area, you know fairly quickly that person's going to slow down to blend into traffic. That's what we know. So, my point is that evidence from your own department or your surrounding departments uh, can help paint a picture of, of what the suspects are going to do of how you can respond to uh, pursuits and then coming back to the use of force it's the same thing if you if you have your data and you know that the suspects are using a certain type of resistance you can design reasonable responses and you can determine through your analysis uh, how much force you're using to deal with suspect resistance and you're going to be able to explain it in a way that's not only going to be important to the community, to your own department, but if you do get sued, you're going to be able to defend it. Thank you very much.